Hey guys, I'm back with another video today. I know uh, last time we had started on the Great Depression and uh, we went over like the causes of the Great Depression, both long term and short term. And now um, we have already passed President Hoover and we are getting into FDR, which is pretty much the main president that you associate with the Great Depression. Because I mean, really, we have a new captain at the wheel. Um, he's steering the ship of state through the storm, and his very inspirational message from his inaugural address, the famous quote that's associated with him, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So, let's learn more about FDR and the New Deal today. So first up, FDR's uh, inauguration almost didn't happen. Several weeks before he had just narrowly escaped an assassination attempt, one that had killed the mayor of Chicago. Um, yeah, we almost didn't have this guy. And this is like one of these points in history where you're like, whoa, if this would have actually happened, our country would be so different because not only was he our president during the Great Depression and helped us, you know, help guide this country, he was also our president throughout World War II. So, just saying, I mean, who knows how we would have fared with that, with any of that, World War II or Great Depression. And here we are. I mean, FDR inaugurated on March 4th, 1933. This is prior to them passing the 20th Amendment, um, which had scaled back uh, the wait time between the inauguration and... Um, the election. So after this point in time, the inauguration will be in January. But FDR is our 32nd president. And I mean, for his campaign song, I mean, he he used happy days are here again, this message of positivity, because really, one of the most popular songs during the Great Depression was, hey, buddy, can you spare a dime? So I mean, to hear a song of optimism, his campaign promoting positivity really, you know, is the shot in the arm that we need as a country to get us back on our feet. So I love this political cartoon for that very reason, because look, at it, it's Dr. Roosevelt here helping the United States get back into better health because the depression has plagued us, the banking troubles have plagued us, plagued us war debt, um, the budget, farm crisis, all of that has plagued this country. And confidence in your doctor is half the battle. So that's what it's really taking. I mean, we got to have confidence in FDR. And FDR is a very capable leader. So, okay, just first things first. He is Teddy's cousin, <laughs> all right? Um, yeah, they're cousins. And <laughs> subsequently, I mean, Teddy is his hero. So, FDR is our first uh, disabled president, and nobody knew it at that time. This is a very rare picture of him in his wheelchair. He was not photographed in his wheelchair uh, while he was president. I mean, you always say, saw the guy either sitting in his car or with speeches. I mean, he used a cane to help him walk. Um, he had the podiums bolted down to the stage so he could lean on them. I mean, he didn't want to show that he couldn't walk because of polio. So really, our country wasn't quite ready yet to be willing and accepting of a president with a disability. So nowadays, I mean, we've got plenty of politicians with um, disabilities. But back then, he wanted to show kind of like strength. So um, FDR is going to do something drastically different from other presidents of the time and even prior. He greatly expands the size of federal government. And instead of government taking this hands-off approach, this laissez-faire approach to things, government is going to be more hands-on. The government's operations are going to be more widespread and he's also going to increase the powers of the presidency. I mean, come on. 
This guy is in office for 12 years. Well, he's elected to be in office for 12 years. So honestly, FDR is going to be the leader that we need at this time. And he has such a compassion for the poor because when he did go down to Georgia for his polio treatments, he sees what happens to the poor rural farmers and to the people of the South um, during this depression. So he kind of like gains this new knowledge and insight, even though he grew up with a very wealthy family. I mean, the Roosevelt's are freaking rich. So um, he is going to align more with the Democratic Party and in part, it's because of that experience that he had um, trying to treat his polio. And um, also in part, his partner in crime here, the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. So Eleanor is going to be one of the most influential First Ladies that we've ever had. Because she's the first one to actually like step out on the campaign. To actually be proactive with her role as First Lady. Because prior to this, I mean, First Lady is like through the parties at the White House. Nah, she is going to be out there amongst the American public trying to help further, you know, FDR's policies. And I mean, these guys make a great team. They really do. So there's young FDR and young Eleanor. She's going to really push FDR to help expand, you know, things for the poor and also for African Americans and other minorities. So she is incredibly active and she is definitely the role model for first ladies who follow in her footsteps. So as far as FDR's cabinet, I mean, this guy goes with the best and the brightest minds. It's his brain trust. That's what he calls his cabinet members. So he gets this group of social, economic, and political thinkers together as his advisors to help try to pull his country out of the Great Depression. And especially on the economic front, they are greatly, greatly influenced by the British economist John Maynard Keynes. And they're going to take a different approach than what had been tried during the 20s and by Hoover. Again, a more proactive approach by the government. So FDR does have the most diverse cabinet in history at that time. He appoints African Americans, Catholics, Jews, and women, including Frances Perkins here, who is the first female cabinet member, and subsequently she is in charge of the Department of Labor. So more of the brain trust rounding out here. We've got Harry Hopkins, Henry Morgenthau, Louis Lowe, Cordell Hull, Frances Perkins, Sam Rosenman, Raymond Moxley, and Rexford Tugwell. So, I mean, these guys are going to definitely help FDR take control of the country again and put it back on its feet. So, we're talking about John Maynard Keynes, and here's the different approach to economics that the Democrats are going to adopt from here on out. What they adopt is Keynesian economics. So John Maynard Keynes is arguing that the money should be invested in the people, the working classes, because after all, they're the ones who do the spending in the economy, not the rich. And it kind of makes sense when you break it down like this. Like, seriously, if you give everybody, say, the stimulus check, okay, the poor and the working classes are going to use that check to buy what they need, right? to use it on like groceries or gas or like whatever they need, clothing. They reinvest it in our economy. And so by increasing the government spending to go ahead and do, you know, like stimulus checks, um, you're putting more money into circulation. And in turn, according to Keynesian economics, this is supposed to prime the pump and gets more spending and more growth going. So because of this increased spending, like at grocery stores and other like consumer goods and services, those businesses will be expected to hire more workers to meet up with the demand. And in turn, those workers will take their paychecks and spend it on the economy some more. So again, more spending, more growth. 
instead of what the Republicans had been doing with Hoover and earlier Republican leaders, which they had more of a belief in supply-side economics, which is trickle-down economics, where the wealth will trickle down to the poor. So you give money to the wealthy under the supply-side economics theory. And in turn, they're supposed to reinvest it in their respective businesses, and that's how the wealth theoretically trickles down. But yeah, the Democrats are not going to believe this whatsoever. I mean, they saw these policies at work under Hoover, and the wealth was not trickling down. The wealthy were just keeping the money. So, um, pretty much this Keynesian economics philosophy is going to be applied to FDR's New Deal program, which is his presidential program to get us out of the Great Depression. So it focuses on the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Now, relief is going to directly help out the people out of work by giving stuff like stimulus checks, all right, and other forms of direct relief like food, clothing, and, well, payments, right, like money. So the recovery part is supposed to recover businesses and the economy as a whole, you know, passing legislation to go ahead and kickstart the economy once more. And then the reform part is what's really going to change the system. We're going to put safeguards in place now to prevent the dumb crap that happened in the 20s from happening again. Yeah, like buying on margin and all that dumb crap. Like we are just going to pass legislation to regulate the stock markets and regulate banking and everything else that kind of put us in this mess. So, FDR is going to get straight to work. I mean, this dude, when he is inaugurated and sworn in on March 4th, um, he is going to call a special session of Congress the next day. I mean, this guy didn't even, like, <laughs> rest up a day after the inauguration parties. I mean, he gets straight to work. So, during the first 100 days of FDR's presidency, there's going to be so many programs passed that help out our country during the Great Depression, and so many of them have lasting effects, which we'll break down right now when we cover the first New Deal. And since Congress, there's a majority of Democrats in Congress, um, legislation is definitely going to get passed, like, right away. I mean, dude, <laughs> it's going to be raining in legislation. <laughs> For real. There are so many new laws and agencies set up by the first New Deal and subsequently by the second New Deal. We're going to refer to them by their initials. It's going to get a little confusing, guys, so don't worry. I got you. I'm going to put up a chart that explains every single one of these um, New Deal programs. So be on the lookout for that. But anyways, um, FDR is definitely going to take a more hands-on approach than his predecessors ever did. So really, I mean, yeah, he's making it rain legislation right there on the left-hand side. That new deal, you wanted action? Here we go. <laughs> and then I love the, the cartoon on the right-hand side too, because I mean, look, it's like FDR um, and on the clock, it says like weeks, right? Um, so here's FDR as a fast worker putting on the moves on the economy. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, during FDR's first 100 days, this is what we see. A lot of stuff. I mean, this guy arguably gets more stuff done during his first 100 days than any other president in history. I mean, he, he hits the ground running. So the first big thing that he's going to do is the banking holiday, which, remember, banks were failing like crazy. The Federal Reserve refused to, like, put more money into the money supply under Hoover, and banks are just closing left and right. And again, if the bank closed on you before you got to take out your money, you were screwed. I mean, really, you had no way of getting your money out of the bank after that. The bank closed it closed. So 
In order to gain more confidence in the banking system, FDR decides to do this bank holiday. He's like, hey, banks, close. (laughs) Close for a couple of days. Let us work this stuff out. And then you can reopen. So what they actually work out is, um, you know, new legislation like the Emergency Banking Relief Act, which we will talk about in a minute, and other works that pretty much um, are going to really overhaul the banking system and, again, gain more confidence in banks by the American public. So um, another thing that FDR does is make good on one of his campaign promises, which is repealing prohibition. I mean, yeah, he brings in more alcohol um, than we had during the 20s, which was none, right, because we had prohibition. So with the 21st Amendment, it officially repeals the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition. And not only are people really happy that they could openly drink and consume and, like, produce alcohol again, but, I mean, there's... There's really (laughs) another reason why FDR did this, too. It's to raise revenue for the government by taxing alcohol. I mean, come on, that's pretty smart. It's like if a president now were to legalize marijuana, that would be kind of like the same effect in a way. Um, Yeah, legalizing it for, like, tax purposes to raise revenue. So, yeah. If FDR were president today, he'd probably do that, just going off of what he did with Prohibition. So one thing that FDR is going to do, which is pretty interesting, um, no president had done this before because, well, they didn't have the technology and, well, a lot of them just didn't really care to do this, but he's going to use radio to go ahead and do what's known as fireside chats, where he makes this weekly address and he explains exactly to the American people, hey, this is what's going on in Congress. This is what we got coming out. This is, you know, how it's going to work. Keeping the people directly informed in government business gains a greater confidence for FDR. And presidents have since done something similar most notably President Obama with his weekly YouTube addresses, which you guys can still find, and most recently, President Biden, who has um, been doing something similar to these fireside chats. So, (laughs) let's go ahead and talk about this first new deal, because, dude, this is done during the first 100 days, so, yeah, buddy, (laughs) here we go. Uh, like I said, guys, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. So let's go ahead and tackle this first New Deal. And um, yeah, <laughs> this may be what we cover today. So, all right, let's go ahead and hit the ground running and go with one of the most famous parts of the first New Deal, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. So, FDR does try to help out the farmers. The Farm Credit Administration is going to loan out $100 million to farmers in the first seven months. And the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, is going to pay another $100 million to plow up 10 of 40 million acres um, that were planted in the 1933 season. So he's plowing up the acres so that it can kind of stabilize the crop prices. Basically, farmers are paid not to farm. (laughs) Because, I mean, think about it. You are trying to stabilize the crop prices. And if you're producing too much, you're oversaturating the market, which drives down the crop prices. So it kind of makes sense. Wheat farmers, corn farmers are paid not to plant. Um, People are paid to just get rid of livestock. So it could raise the um, prices of agriculture and, well... Um, meat and stuff. So because of these interventions, farm income is going to rise by 50% and uh, the surpluses are greatly reduced. So therefore, the prices are going to rise overall. So um, yeah, the Supreme Court has a big battle with FDR (laughs) over his New Deal. And this is one of the things that they strike down. 
Okay, here we go. National Industrial Recovery Act is going to organize the National Recovery Administration. So antitrust laws are going to be temporarily suspended. Businesses are going to be asked to voluntarily follow codes to regulate wages, hours, and prices. So this is a point in time where he does this to allow businesses to grow. Not necessarily unregulated, but more so, he, he kind of gives them temporary freedom. So what we established at this time is 40-hour work week, the 40-cent minimum wage, and FDR is labor union friendly, so he's going to protect the rights of workers to organize and to collective bargain. But here comes the Supreme Court again. <laughs> and two years later, this as well is declared unconstitutional. So FDR is also going to try to put people to work with the Public Works Administration. He wants to try to prime the pump and also, to kill two birds with one stone, he wants to improve the infrastructure of the country, which is severely lacking. So he's going to spend $3.3 billion to get a public works project going so that it could put these people who are out of work back in work and improve the country at the same time. Plus, he knows that these people are going to spend their money on various goods in the economy, which in turn, like we said, with Keynesian economics, it's going to get the economy to grow and more workers would be hired to meet the demand and so on and so forth. So, I mean, yeah, he wants to definitely prime that pump. So these are the types of projects we're doing, like um, creating government buildings, well, making government buildings, bridges, dams, like all of that. Because, I mean, look, they're going to um, use the Army Corps of Engineers to come up with the Bonneville Power Dam in Oregon, um, to go ahead and further work on the Hoover Dam as well. I mean, yeah, public works projects get people working, get paychecks to them, they spend the money prime the pump. So here's part of the, like the actual relief programs. See, Federal Emergency Relief Administration is going to directly give out checks, like stimulus checks, to the unemployed so that they could survive the winter. There's also matching grants that they give to states to help out with local relief efforts. They set up camps for unemployed women so that they could gain valuable job skills and, um, you know, just try to get back out there and work. So one of the most famous programs, however, that FDR came up with, and one of the most successful ones, is going to be the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. So this one employs young men between the ages of 18 and 25 um, to go ahead and go out to like the national parks, to um, go out into the environment and you know, create trails and help establish these national parks. So over two, two million young people are going to enroll in this program. And what makes this program so appealing is that, you know, they're leaving home and going on an adventure. Plus, they're guaranteed to have part of their paycheck sent home to their families so that they're still providing for them and they don't have to feel guilty about it. So usually, guys, um, when the CCC is tested, you're going to see pictures like this, where it's a bunch of dudes working outside, <laughs> like in the woods and stuff. So, again, this helps out young men um, get paid for this work, helps out the national parks and other areas like this, and, you know, part of their paycheck's going home. So, it's helping the families as well see these guys, you know, uh, chipping away at stone to help build a trail. These guys are replanting trees in a burnt down forest. I mean, they're going to definitely kind of like <laughs> do something that Teddy would be proud of, right? Like fixing the environment, helping it out. And FDR is getting people to work. 
So another big program that is going to be very successful for FDR is the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA. And what we're talking about here is this dark green part, which that is the Tennessee Valley. And all those dots right there, the red, you know, the yellow, the purple, are going to represent power plants. Because look at where they're located. They're located along the rivers in the Tennessee Valley. And rural areas like the Tennessee Valley didn't have power at this time. So let's go ahead and bring them into the 20th century and give these rural areas electricity that they badly need. Plus, you're going to employ the people of the area. They're going to have so much of an investment in making sure that this project works because, I mean, they could, they're greatly going to benefit from it. And, of course, again, them getting a paycheck is going to help with, with economic spending, right, and getting the economy going. So uh, Senator George Norris has this idea to go ahead and develop the whole Tennessee project well, the whole project in the Tennessee Valley, and the TVA is the great success. So we can definitely bring in a cheap electrical power, um, control the floods in the area, replant forests, encourage industry to come to this area as well, and it serves as the model to, like, electrifying rural America. And again, even today, it's still the number one producer of electricity in the United States. So you can see FDR is looking towards the future. He starts with the Tennessee Valley Authority. He puts more projects under his belt, brings more power to rural America. The community greatly benefits, and then he's going to extend this program nationwide. So more pictures from the Tennessee Valley Authority. One program that wasn't exactly successful, though, is going to be the Civil Works Administration. And it's not successful because um, we throw money at local governments and they kind of are wasteful with it. And there's a lot of like bribes and graft. They're supposed to improve the infrastructure in local areas with this um, and put people to work, right? But like I said, there's a lot of waste with this and um, this project's going to be abandoned in 1934. So um, some of the projects that were done by the Civil Works Administration are going to be stuff like digging a new sewer system um, and just random, random things to get people to work. Another thing that's still around today, actually, is going to be the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Well, rather, what it helps to set up, which is going to be um, these loans that we will see under the Federal Housing Administration. So um, one way to stop foreclosures at this time was to go ahead and help to refinance loans, mortgages that the American people had. So the Ho Homeowners Loan Corporation is going to buy up mortgages from banks and refinance them at rates that these homeowners can, you know, go ahead and keep their homes, lowering payments and whatnot. So in the end, about 20% of homeowners are going to be saved um, from foreclosure. So really, this is kind of like in the Great Recession when the government bought out these big loan corporations called Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And they owned like the majority of um, student loans, also Big, 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 big chunk of like mortgages and whatnot, and the government seized these two companies essentially and took them over and um, started negotiating lower rates for these people. So, as far as like the banks go, though, this is the overhaul of the banking system. We've got the Glass Steagall Act, which in 1933 it's going to be expanded. And it, now it makes it illegal for banks to speculate in the stock market with depositor funds, which is what banks were doing during the 1920s. So what it also does, however, is set up the FDIC, which is probably arguably one of the most important parts of the Glass-Steagall Banking Act, because the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is going to prevent this whole big mess of like when banks close, you go bankrupt, 
and there's no way to get your money, now we have a safeguard with the FDIC. It's going to guarantee individual deposits. And this is going to help stabilize the banking system, plus raise the confidence of the people to put their money in banks again. Because what the FDIC does is at that time, it's going to ensure um, deposits up to a certain amount. It used to be up to 100000 but Obama expanded, I think, to like 250000 or 200000 So for if you have that much money in the bank or less, it's going, the government is going to have your back in case that bank goes bankrupt. So you don't lose your money. The government will give you your money, which, yeah, t- this is freaking important because in 2008, if we didn't have the FDIC, whoa, we would have been so screwed. <laughs> like the Great Recession probably would have been worse than the Great Depression, kind of screwed. So um, the Securities Act This is passed in 1933, and we kind of lump it into all of this banking and stock market regulation because what it helps to do is regulate the stock markets by forming the Security and Exchange Commission. This is passed in 1934, and really it's going to curb all of those abuses of the stock market we saw in the 20s and prior, so no more dumb crap like buying on margin or (laughs) getting insider, you know, information to do insider trading. I mean, yeah, none of that's legal now. And the Security and Exchange Commission makes damn sure that no shady business is happening with the stock market. So another thing that FDR is going to do that's going to be different from his predecessors is he finally gets us off the gold standard. And that's to encourage some inflation so that more money can go into the system. I mean, come on, Keynesian economics, right? And therefore, you know, manufacturers can get more money for their products. People can get more money to pay things. A little bit of inflation is not bad, guys. Hyperinflation is bad because that's a lot of inflation. But a little bit is not bad and can help stimulate the economy, which is exactly what FDR was trying to do by breaking us off that gold standard. Again, in line with Keynesian economics. So another program that's still around today from the First New Deal is the Federal Housing Administration, rather the FHA. So this is going to help make it possible for young people, um, young adults, to go ahead and own their first home. Because seriously, guys, this is how it works. (laughs) Let's say you want to buy a house that's worth $100,000, all right? Banks expect you to put down 20% as a down payment. So I don't know about you guys, but after college, will you guys have 20 grand just laying around and be like, yeah, sure, let's buy a house? Hell to the no. (laughs) So what the FHA is going to do, it's going to basically tell banks to chill (laughs) and um, say, hey, we got this. We will back up this loan, this mortgage, um, just... All they have to do is put a 5% down payment instead. So instead of that 20 grand that you have to do for that $100,000 house, now it's only five grand. And that is way more easy (laughs) to do than the 20% down, right? So um, if the homeowner defaulted, again, the FHA would pay the bank back the balance. So this is going to try to encourage the banks to make more loans, more mortgages, and get the American people, you know, owning homes and such to stimulate the housing market as well. So again, everything is to stimulate the economy. Now, FDR is doing all this stuff, and let's just face it, guys. Haters gonna hate. (laughs) He's got haters on both sides, man. He's got haters amongst fellow liberals and haters amongst the conservatives. So really, he he comes under attack by both sides. And um, the liberals, people on like his spectrum, are wanting him to do more. They think that he's not doing enough (laughs) to end the Great Depression and intervene in the economy. On the right hand side, though, um, they're thinking he's doing too much that we're like socialists, Border non-communist, and this is not the American way. So, 
um, the conservatives are basically going to say, yeah, dude, we don't like your big government style, your hands-on approach. We like our laissez-faire style and small government approach. So they want the government to stay out of the economy, let the depression cure itself, basically keep the status quo. So really, I mean, the liberal critics, of course, are going to be more on the extreme side, um, more far left, like socialists. They're criticizing the New Deal for doing too much for business and too little for the unemployed and working poor or the elderly or minorities or women. So they, they, you know, attack FDR in those fronts. The conservative critics, however, are be like, yeah, the government's doing too much. We don't like this. <laughs> this is socialism. This is communism. You know, they throw those words around when they really don't know what they mean. But anyways, um, so they feel that federal programs such as the WPA, which we'll discuss in the Second New Deal, labor laws like the Wagner Act, again, we'll discuss in the Second New Deal, are basically socialism bordering on communism. So business leaders really don't like FTR because of the increased regulations on industry um, that he's going to have in his Second New Deal, along with the pro-union stance that he has in the Second New Deal. And they also don't like the deficit spending that's going on, where the government is spending more money than what it is taking in. Again, that's a piece of the Keynesian economic system to prime the pump and to get spending going by the American public. So let's go ahead and hear more from the critics from the right. You're going to have groups like the American Liberty League, which in 2008, they're kind of like the Tea Party. So um, these guys are going to oppose FDR's New Deal because they want to defend and uphold the Constitution, foster the right to work, earn, save, and acquire property. So yeah, they, they basically think FDR is like a socialist and a communist. Um, and he's taking America down this dangerous road of socialism. So, for the Liberty League, um, they're mostly Republicans, some conservative Democrats. Um, Al Smith is going to be amongst them. Northern industrialists and executives and major corporations are also going to be in here too, like General Motors, DuPont, all of them. And they believe that the New Deal programs would be paid for by new taxes on the rich in business. So yeah, they don't want people rich in their pocketbooks to pay for this stuff. So it's another reason why they oppose FDR. And um, they believe that the New Deal ran counter to, well, our tradition, like of local control, individual responsibility, laissez-faire. So they don't like that it's shaking up things. These guys are going to go after the, the election in 1936 because by that point in time, FDR is hella popular. But anyways, those are his critics to the right. The critics to the left are far more dangerous because um, they're on his same side. So, and they're going to attack him for various things. The most dangerous critic, however, is going to be this guy, Huey Long. So Huey Long is called the Kingfish. He is the governor of Louisiana, and his quote is, every man a king. So this guy is immensely popular in Louisiana, and he's immensely popular because of his program called Share Our Wealth. If there is ever a threat to FDR and his presidency, it's this guy, because he's that popular. So... His share our wealth program is going to be like this. Let's try to break it down a little bit. He wants to basically have a salary ceiling and a salary floor. So what we mean by that is that for people who make more than, let's say, like $100,000, he's going to take that wealth and redistribute it amongst society so that everybody else is making a minimum wage per year. So let's say the minimum wage that he wants to do is like $30,000 for the year. Yeah, everybody making above the $100,000, that wealth is going to be redistributed. 
it's basically, yeah, share our wealth, right? <laughs> the share our wealth program. So of course, this program is going to be so popular in the Great Depression. I'm telling you guys, if there was ever a chance for this country to turn socialist or communist, it was during this time. So Huey Long is wanting the government to, yeah, do what we said, to confiscate all income over a million dollars um, and use that money to go ahead and redistribute to families so that they have a base salary. So, of course, all of this makes him extremely popular, but this guy is a little strange. He's very authoritarian. I mean, he even has his own secret guard in Louisiana. So... Yeah, I don't know which way we would have gone if Huey Long was elected. Who knows, man? This guy might have been friends with Stalin. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Stalin's already in charge at this point. But um, he is murdered on the steps of the Louisiana Capitol in September 1935. So his movement is going to collapse. But he was already starting to make the bid for, you know, the presidential campaign at that point in time. So, another big critic of FDR is going to be Dr. Francis Townsend. This guy criticizes FDR for not coming up with a plan to help out the elderly. So, really what Francis Townsend comes up with is basically the precursor to Social Security. And, um, you know, giving the elderly a monthly um, stipend to help sustain them. So, FDR has a more moderate plan um, that he puts in place during the Second New Deal, which will become Social Security. So he does listen to this critic. Another critic is Father Charles Coughlin, who's a radio priest. He's very popular on the radio. Um, this guy thinks that FDR is not going far enough. So um, by he wants FDR to go ahead and issue more inflated currency, nationalize all the banks, but um, because he's both anti-Semitic and anti-capitalist, and amongst other things, he's going to lose a bit of credibility, and, you know, he kind of goes away after a while. So, also Upton Sinclair, yeah, the dude who wrote The Jungle, that <laughs> Upton Sinclair, is going to um, come up with an epic program, which, dude, I love the wordplay on that. <laughs> His epic program is to end poverty in California. And so he wants to get the state to buy up the closed factories, unused land, and help to put unemployed Californians to work by making goods and growing food. So he's defeated um, in this election for California governor. But, I mean, he is a critic of FDR because, again, he thinks that FDR is not going far enough. So, I think that this is a good stopping point for us today, guys, because, whoa, buddy, we've got the second new deal coming up, <laughs> and there is a lot to chew with this one. So, I will cover the second new deal with you guys in this next part of the lecture, and um, yeah, I'll probably end this off with like a video in class or something for today's stuff. So that was the first new deal for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this and learned a lot because, yeah, FDR does a ton of stuff. So, all right, guys, I will catch you on the next one. Bye.